So yeah, thanks everyone for uh, coming out today. I wanted to talk a little bit today about jQuery and jQuery performance. And when I was prepping my material for today, I uh, I wanted to talk about performance naturally at jQuery and how to write better code uh, using, using jQuery. And as I was working on my material, I kept coming back to the problem is that you had to have a greater understanding of how jQuery works internally. So I, I made a slight tweak to, to the, the topic today, which is I want to cover jQuery selectors, CSS selectors, um, in particular, and look at jQuery's engine that powers that, and kind of walk you through how it works so you can better understand how to write better selectors that will make your application faster um, in the app. So uh, I wanted to show a couple of selectors and just kind of as, as a topic of thought because they're, they may look similar and they may produce identical results, but the performance underlying them is dramatically different. Um, so I mean, we have the, the typical jQuery function and you know, you, you do something, you have like find all the zips. Oh, in jQuery we have uh, uh, the first method, which allows you to you know, restrict the set down to just the first div that you found. Yeah, pretty simple. You also have it in selector form. You know, you can do the same thing. You can say div colon first. And we've had this for a very long time, ever since the beginning of jQuery. Um, and this is relatively new. We had this um, in the last year or so. A little fuzzy. Um, but, so these produce identical results. Um, and one is way, way, way faster than the other. I won't tell you which yet. Um, another one has something with an ID, and then looking for a div or something. It doesn't really matter. Okay? And then this one. Looking for something with an ID, and then using jQuery's find method to find the divs. Right. Again, they produce identical results. They will find all the divs that are inside the item with that particular ID. Uh, but one is, again, way, way faster than the other. Um, so I kind of want to take a step back because at its core, uh, jQuery selectors are all rooted against previous selector all. So this is a method that is provided by browsers and it's Something that was added, I guess, uh, I'm trying to think, like maybe four years ago. Um, and it's the new Selectors API, but it's provided by the W3C. So this particular uh, API gives you uh, the pre selector all method. This method is immensely useful. It essentially took all the selector engines that existed at the time. Uh, you know, jQuery had one, Prototype had one, Dojo had one, everyone had one, and made it much, much faster. So essentially, what it did is allow you to put in, you know, a CSS selector and get back, you know, an array-like thing of DOM nodes, which is essentially what every JavaScript engine did at that time. So that's fantastic. We were, like every single engine switched over to using Query Center all almost instantaneously. The problem is, is that they kind of forgot to ask the library authors if it was actually going to work well for them. Uh, so there was a number of issues, a number of bugs in the implementation of Creative Sector All across platforms. Probably the two largest issues were uh, error reporting, and, and that there really wasn't any. Um, and uh, um, I guess the general, oh, it, it, it's just the moodiness, I'll say, for lack of a better word. I'll explain what that means. So what happened was that when they went and implemented the pre selector all, they were implementing it against what already existed in the browser. You know, they were just kind of uh, merging their existing CSS engine to make it work in JavaScript land. Um, so one of, the, one of the changes that they made was that when you have something like, uh, so the, like a jQuery, for example, if you were to do, um, I don't know, find all the spans, and then you provide it a context, 
maybe pass it, I don't know, but a, 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 a note or a variable with a name div or something. You know, so you're providing a note as a context as this group. So for example, if you have a DOM, you know, that was a div, and inside was a span. It would find all the spans that are inside the div. And so this is a way to do that rooting. Um, the, the issue that, that, that occurred is that when they implemented query center all, the, the selector can go outside of the root. Now, th th this sounds really weird, but let me see if I can uh, find an example here. Um, we can do, if we, if we have the markup, And this, and this affected every single JavaScript, uh, JavaScript engine. And, and for this reason, we end up having to write really, really weird code. Um, uh, so for example, let's say we have uh, div, div, uh, span, I think we'll do it. Um, so let's say we wanted to, let's get this an ID just to make it clear. I do tests. Okay. So if we wanted to find all the thing, all the spans that were inside, uh, let's say this particular test here, and, and, and find all the spans that were inside another div. Okay. So this is assume for the sake of argument here that we're finding. I have the name of test. All right. So. What's happening here is that when we find, when we run this particular selector, so we're, right, we're, we found this element with the ID of test, okay? And we're saying, give me all the spans that are inside a div. Now the problem is, is that there are no spans that are inside a div. We're, there's only one span there. And all the other, all, all the browser JavaScript engines, what they did was is they, they went and said, okay, we found a span, and now we found a div either here or up here. And which is completely counterintuitive. It, it actually escapes the container in which you're inside of. So this is uh, a case where, uh, one case amongst many, so uh, where JavaScript engines today have to route around the weirdness that the browser provides. And that the browser is providing a counterintuitive API, and we're trying to make something that's clearer and easier to use. So one of the questions are frequently asked uh, amongst users of jQuery or other libraries that matter is why use jQuery selector engine? Uh, say, because the browsers now provide query selector all. Why not just use query selector all? Especially if you're on like a platform like WebKit, if you're just targeting you know, uh, iOS devices or something, or Android devices. Android devices. Well, the issue is because, uh, not only because of error reporting, which we'll get to in a second, but because of issues like this, like the API just works in really strange ways that you may not expect. Okay, so I wanted to uh, take a step back here and uh, talk about error reporting real quick. So the second problem is that anytime you put in a selector, it doesn't really give you a useful error. Uh, it is, it's a, if you put it up in valid selector. Um, so if you put in, let's say, uh, you know, div, I don't know, one, blue mark which obviously does not exist, is not a real selector. Um, this query center all just give you an exception. It'll say something bad happened uh, somewhere, and you should probably fix it. And it's, it's really, really ambiguous like that. You don't know if you had a syntax there. Maybe you maybe got a typo. Maybe you were trying to do something that didn't actually exist. You know, it's, it's really ambiguous in that way. So one of the problems from our perspective, at least from Jake's perspective, is that it's really hard to provide better feedback to you, the developer. You know, because we want to be able to say, hey, it looks like your problem doesn't have a typo there. You know, just read this, you can fix it. It looks like you meant to say colon visible. It looks like you meant to say colon first or something like that. Um, and, but instead, we just have to kind of say, like, well, something bad happened. Sorry. So, uh, so, but, and, and so this is unfortunately something we can't really work around without a, a severe performance penalty. So, I mean, there, but on top of this, there are a number of like really bad issues that exist with a uh, query uh, site call, uh, namely in browser bugs that exist in the platforms. Now, the problem is, is that like a query site call is, again, like I said, it's, it's amazingly fast. 
So everyone is sort of compelled to use it because it's, it's one of the fastest options that exist. Now, the, the, but the, again, the issue becomes that if it's the fastest thing that exists, and it's essentially this giant black box, in that you go and insert your CSS selector into it, you get your DOM elements out at the end, but somewhere in there, you know, magic happens. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's transforming your query into the final result. Uh, and because of that black box, you have to do dramatic you know, somersaults to work around this. So, you know, like, like for example, in Internet Explorer, uh, in their query center all implementation, if you try to do query center all on an object element, um, uh, you know, like what we might use to you know, embed uh, Flash or something like that, if you try to do query center all on an object element, it just doesn't work. Uh, it just it always returns an empty set. Um, and that's just the fun thing to have to find. Um, so, but thankfully, that's something that we work around in, in our country. Um, and there's uh, another issue that's uh, a really bad issue in, uh, in WebKit, actually. So it's interesting to note that in, in jQuery, uh, we, obviously the vast majority of the bug fixes we work around are Internet Explorer Center, those are not surprising. Uh, but the second most browser that we work around is WebKit. Because WebKit is so fast moving, and they have so many releases coming out on so many different platforms, that the, just the quantity of bugs that come out is just uh, startling. So like one of the really nasty ones uh, that's good us with uh, Chris and Girl is it lets you have um, you know, a div, a class, uh, um, test, and this is all other case. And then you now write a selector that is, you know, give me anything with a, you know, a, say div.test. Now in every single browser, this will work. It's case insensitive. You know, if you just say dot test, it'll get everything with a class of test. Except for WebKit and Quartz code. So if you, if you forget to leave off a, a, you know, a dot type or something, uh, it won't return that. And that was a weird one. That was a one that spent a long time in there against. Because, again, it's not really obvious. But again, that's something that jQuery now works around. Okay, so all of this is just kind of, uh, I guess, a, a, word, a word of warning of things that, uh, of bad things that exist with query cycle all. Um, because it's sort of a preface of behind what I want to talk about next, which is, you know, all the things that, you know, jQuery does in its own selector engine to try to make things better for you. So, one of the very first things that we do is we look for faster paths to get you what you want. And specifically, we do that for, uh, when you search for something with an ID, something with a tag name, something with a class, and the body element. So we look for those four cases specifically, because they're all four cases that we can optimize dramatically, and do dramatically way, way faster than anything queries like they're all can do. So uh, if you crack open the source code of jQuery, uh, you'll see inside the main jQuery uh, uh, you know, dollar sign function. That what we do is we look at the string that's being passed in, and we try to be smart about what uh, what we're trying to do. So, for example, if you pass in the string, there's nothing but you know like you know pound sign some ID. We will completely skip using preset for all, and we'll just use the native built in get element by ID. Get element by ID is way way faster. I I'm not sure how many factors faster it is, but it's it's significant. Um, we do the same thing for tag names. So if you just pass in you know, a generic textual tag name, we just we use get elements by tag name to get uh, get all those elements. Same thing for classes. We just if you pass into something that is just dot some class name, we optimize and use get elements by class name if the browser provides it. And then finally for the body element, we use one shortcut built to by browser. Uh, so, uh, the browser provides uh, a property on the document called body. Uh, they actually just added a new one called dot head, so you can get the, the header that way as well. But the nice thing here is that we look to see if you know, the body is passed in, and we just short, short circuit, we don't even call get this by tagging it, we just return the body element and we're done. Um, uh, one of the reasons why we did this, uh, I, I won't talk too much about benchmarks, 
But benchmarks are sort of uh, one of those things that are sort of omnipresent in, in developers' lives, and especially so when you're looking at things like uh, selector engines. So, I mean, the thing is that we want to know how fast the code is that are running and, and how it compares to other frameworks. So one particular uh, uh, benchmark that came out that was comparing uh, selector engines uh, really made heavy use of the body element. So it was looking for a body and then doing something uh, based upon that. And we found that if all we did was added a shortcut here, it made us like something ridiculous like five times faster than the benchmark, uh, which is just you know, absurd. It was a really bad benchmark, but it was one that like, everyone links to. Um, so but it, it really didn't affect us at all, and uh, it's like two lines of code. Um, so the, this is the sort of thing that you get. Uh, when I used to work at uh, Mozilla, there was all sorts of this thing going on uh, with all the different benchmarks. So you know, lies, damn lies, and you know, benchmarks. Uh, it, it just gets pretty bad. Um, it's essentially, you know, anytime those benchmarks come out that compare browser performance, uh, almost always someone's cheating on it. You can guarantee that either Firefox or WebKit or Internet Explorer is cheating somehow. Uh, and, and cheating the way it's not really Yes? Can you put in more than one class tag into a query? Sorry, say again? Can you put in more than one class tag or name tag or whatever into a query, or do you have to have a separate one for each class and tag? So do you have to so say do you have to put in the tag name with the test? Do you can you put in more more than one? Oh, more than one. So so absolutely. So it, it so I, just just to back up, the cases I mentioned here are, are the cases we just make really really fast. Um, any other case we pass off a free selector all, and it's still just normal fast, right? Uh, so I'll these are cases where especially with ID, because ID is used so frequently. Uh, we want to make sure that that is as fast as absolutely possible. So yeah, so if you did, um, you know, compound ID, comma, you know, I don't know, other ID, you know, that was sort of the normal query cycle all or, or what have you. Or if you're in, or, or in an explorer, it'll go back to the older engine. So, um, so the, the kind of backtrack here, so uh, jQuery selector engine has gone through uh, a couple, uh, two, two different lives. Um, in its first life, it was uh, what you call a left or right engine. And, and in its second life now as sizzle, it, it's a right or left engine. So to explain that, so let's say we have a slot press like this. Um, okay, so you have div, you want to find all, so you want to find all the spans that are a child of the div. So this is like a basic uh, uh, CSS2. Um, so the gotcha here is that it, it all matters in how you interpret this statement. The way browsers interpret this natively when you look at uh, CSS is that they say, okay, find all the spans, now find all the parents, and then see if those parents are divs. And so they do it from right to left. So this is, when you're writing a, a, a CSS selector, you're worried about a CSS selector performance on your page. Which in most cases you shouldn't have to be, uh, it, it's, it, unless you have like a really crazy, unless you're like Gmail or something, you probably don't have to worry about it. Um, but the absolute slowest selection you can possibly write is probably something like star space star space star space star, and then essentially any time you add in a, a space, it gets so much more computationally complex. Um, because the issue is, is that it's going to have to go down and essentially find any element on the page and go and see if any of those elements have any element uh, uh, as a parent, or uh, sorry, not as a parent, as an ancestor, and then see if that has any as an ancestor, and see if that has any as an ancestor. So it keeps multiplying the complexity. It gets ridiculous. Uh, so yeah, don't break some of this. Not that you would, but uh, this is just something that's particularly bad. Um, okay, so. In jQuery's first leg, the way that we implemented it was left to right. So what we do is, is we go through, find all the divs on the page, go through each of the divs and find all their children, and then find all the ones that were spans. So the, I mean, the way we ended up implementing that was pretty straightforward. We're just we end up doing you know, the, the data of get elements by tag. This is before uh, um, pretty much all existed. Okay, so the way that we do it now, though, is that we go through and find, they say, we're going to find all the spans, 
check their parents to see if they're dibs. Now, you can kind of see how the second wave can be faster. Because the thing is, is that in the second wave, you only have to call the native get element by tag name once. Whereas in this one, we had to call it potentially multiple times, many times, in fact. Um, so here, we just had to call it once to get all the spans, and then go up and check the pair on each of them. So, uh, so this is how jQuery currently works. It works in this right to left fashion. The gotcha, though, is that so we implemented it this way. It works well. It, it, it's, it's, it's definitely fast for, for some cases. But we're hitting a lot of weird edge cases. Um, and ones that may require us to rewrite the jQuery selector engine to go back to the left and right way of doing things. So to backtrack a, a second, uh, because the, the reason why we're, we're talking about doing a rewrite now is it all comes back to jQuery's custom selectors. So this is something that we implemented early on. Uh, and this is the very first version of jQuery. So you have positional selectors. You have, you know, colon first, you know, uh, 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 colon last, some of that. Uh, you have even odd and greater than or less than. So you can find things by the position uh, uh, on the page. Um, you also have uh, uh, other selectors like um, uh, visible, you know, uh, hidden, stuff like that. You also have uh, selectors that allow you to find form elements easier. So you can do uh, uh, colon text, uh, 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 colon, oh, colon button, you know, all stuff like that. So that way you, you find all the buttons on the page, you know, all the input buttons and input text fields and stuff like that. Then there, there's ones for every single type of uh, input element. So in, including the new HTML file as well. Um, so we've added in a, a bunch of these. We've, we've even gone so far as to extend some of the base functionality in jQuery. So for example, we, add, we added in, uh, uh, so in the native selectors you have not. This is in uh, CSS, whatever CSS. So you can say things like, give me all the divs that do not have the ID of the ID, or something like that. So that, that would, it, it, it's a limited uh, selector. Now this is nice, it's, it's, it's definitely useful, and uh, a lot of people use it for web pages. The problem is, is that what you put in here is highly limited. You can only put things in there that, you can only put a single statement in there. So you can only put one ID, or one class name, or one tag name, or an attribute name, and, and that's it. You can't put anything else. So jQuery, uh, so essentially if you look at that and say, well that's really stupid, like the, the only being able to put one item in there is, is way too restrictive. Because um, like, you know, what if you want to be able to say, all right, give me all the divs that are not, um, um, so for example, give me all the divs that are not inside uh, of the test element. Or, you know, give me all the divs that, um, and this is another custom jQuery selector, has span. So give me all the divs that does not have a span inside of it. Uh, so this allows you to write really expressive uh, uh, selectors. And it's especially useful if you're building things like a, like a menu. You know, you can say, like, give me all the unordered, uh, or give me all of this item, so do not have this item inside of it. Uh, so you do styling based upon that. If we had this in CSS right now, you'd be able to do really cool stuff. But we don't. Okay, we are. Um, so at least with these jQuery custom selectors, though, almost almost unanimously, all the performance issues that come up in jQuery applications now come back to jQuery's custom selectors. And the reason for this, um, I mean, it's really sad. And so because I really love these selectors, and all these custom selectors, it, it, the reason is that pretty much any time I see any of these. And remember what I was talking about before about query selector all and its bad error report. Now, if query selector all had come back and said, "Oh, hey, it looks like we're trying to do last," you know, maybe you should probably do something else instead. You know, if it said that, that would be fantastic. We'd be like, "Okay, you try to do last. Let's tweak around it. Let's adjust the selector somehow and make it better." But the problem is, is that query selector all just come back and says something bad happened. 
and we don't know what happened. And we have to, essentially when that happens, we simply just throw our hands up and we just go in one or one select direction. And we just hope it works. Um, now, so the, the issue is, is that when we see a selector like, um, and I brought this up in the beginning, you know, uh, like div pull last. Right now in jQuery, uh, what we would love to have happen is we run like three selector all, and then we grab the last element that was returned. That would be, that would make a lot of sense, um, and I hope we can get there someday, but it's actually incredibly hard to do that. Um, so, so what's happening now is we're uh, you know, doing get almost by tag name, and then we're filtering down uh, and getting the last item. The filter is actually much more complex uh, uh, than it probably needs to be. So the, the, the issue is then is that it's not as smart as you think it might be. And uh, especially if you have cases like, um, like this. Like, like the last span, or sorry, the last div, the kind of span beside it. Um, so, I mean, you would think in this case that it would go through and then you'll find you know, the last span of the page, and then find all, sorry, last div of the page, the final the span beside it. Uh, but that's not what it does or not, because remember, jQuery now works right to left. So it goes through the page, finds all the spans, finds all the divs, that are an ancestor, and then finds the last one on the page, which is a real mind twister. It's, it's a really, really gnarly code, and for that reason, there's a lot of bugs in it. Um, the, the issue is that when, Jake, when, when we wrote these, and created these custom selectors, like last, we were writing it with the intent that it was going to be working in this left or right engine. It makes a ton more sense when you read it left or right. When you read it and say, all right, find all the divs, now give me the last one. All right, well, that's easy. You just find the this, and there's the last one. And now find all the spans, and you're done. It's really fast. But when you work in this right to left way, it, it, it just it ends up being really gnarly. So the issue now becomes is that because we have to do this extra parsing, and we can't use uh, query select of all and all that nicety, it ends up being really, really slow. So to go back to that initial example I provided, where we have, you know, if you're finding all the divs, then call it dot last. This one is much, much faster. Uh, now, the, again, this may seem weird because you're actually calling an additional method uh, in addition to the selector. But the reason why it's so much faster is we can use our really fast code right here. We can use our, our quick shortcut to do get elements by tagging, and then just quickly reduce it down to the last item in the set. Whereas in, in cases like this, we have to go through our old slow code paths to find the exact last element of the page. Um, and this goes for pretty much every single custom jQuery selector. So all the positional ones, all the visibility ones, the input ones, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, so obviously that's not ideal. You know, we don't want this to be the case uh, because we generally find these selectors to be you know, quite useful. Uh, so one of the things we want to do is we want to add some improvements into jQuery to make this much, much simpler. So one of the things that we're, we're looking to do here is actually make it so that uh, uh, you don't have to necessarily worry about this case here. So one of the things we want to do is so that, let's say we go into this example here. Can we find the first div and then find the state inside it? Is, well, first of all, we're thinking about going back to rewriting again, the selector engine to be left to right. Um, again, it won't be ideal. It, it, we think that we may take some performance in some cases, but we'll have you know, a better level of, of clarity and less bugs, we hope. Um, so what we're kind of hoping here is that we can go through this selector, we'll take it and we'll put it into pre-selector all, and if it throws an error at us, then we'll take a step back, and rather than just kind of ignoring pre pre-select all, what we'll do is we'll take a step back and try to do the best that we can. So what we'll do is we'll go through and read left to right, and read up until we hit a selector that we don't know, uh, or, or, or that we don't mind, but that pre-select all doesn't understand. So what we can then do is take all of this, well, not all this case, it's just the case, put it in pre-select all. Get the results, 
you do sit down to just the first algorithm, and then again, take that result, put it in the career cycle off, and get all the spans out. So essentially, we're kind of injecting the process. It's as if we took this and wrote it like this. Find all the digits, get the first, now find all the spans. Okay, so that's what we're kind of hoping to do, is that we're kind of hoping to change the selector parsing here so that it turns it into what you intended to do anyway. So that way, you will still get the full performance benefits, but without having to stress about the particular weirdness of the engine. So this is something, but we don't have an immediate timeline in this. Uh, right now, we're working on jQuery 1.7, uh, so this might not get in until uh, 1.8 or so, depending on how much time I have to dedicate to this. Uh, so uh, the, the, we're, hoping, we're hoping that this will work out well. So one of the things that makes uh, uh, our engine a particularly interesting, I feel, is that we do something where we try to fail as fast as possible. Now this may seem a little bit counterintuitive, but I'll, I'll, I'll show you what I mean. Um, okay, so let's, uh, uh, going back to some of the selectors that I showed you earlier. Oh, 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 that's right, that's right. They're on game time. Okay. So this particular selector here. This is find something with a specific ID that is inside of a div. Now, this particular one here, uh, um, based on what I told you already about jQuery's engine, jQuery's engine works again right to the left. Um, so it's going to start over here and look at the ID. Now the nice part about that is that uh, we can quickly determine if this ID determines the page. So what jQuery's engine is trying to do internally is find the, the fastest way possible to determine if this selector is not going to work. So for example, what we do here is we look through the entire selector, and this works for this one as well. It would be good. So it's just the same thing, reverse. Obviously, a different selector. But in both of these cases, what we do is we go into the selector and look for the ID. Look for the fact that you're looking for an ID. And then quickly try to scoop through and see if this ID exists in the page. The reason why we do this is that get on the by ID is the absolute fastest method we have of querying a page. It is faster than any other method bar none. Um, and so for this reason, what we do is we go through and find any case where we produce an ID anywhere in the selector and see if it fails. Because if it fails, if there is nothing with that ID on the page, we can immediately just stop. We don't have to do anything else. We don't have to go up or down or sideways. It doesn't matter. It, because we instantly know that we don't have to do anything else. Now, what's the interesting thing about this is that the failing case is actually really important to jQuery. Because the way you write jQuery code is that you kind of write it with the assumption that their elements could be on the page or could not be on the page. You don't necessarily have to care. So you can say stuff like, uh, you know, find all the data in the class of the test, uh, you know, and attach a, a click handler, uh, you know, something like that. Okay. Uh, so you could do this. And you, can just, and you can safely put it on any page, e even if there isn't a, a div in the class of test on the page. Because jQuery will run the selector quickly and hopefully you know, fail over it, but you return the set of build elements quickly. You know, because jQuery encourages you to write your selectors as if you were doing it in CSS. You know, because if you're writing your CSS, you're just going to include all your CSS expressions in your style sheet. You know, you're not going to worry about if something is or isn't going to be on the page. Um, if you think about it, it'd be kind of a crazy world if you had if an error was thrown every single time you wrote uh, a selector that wasn't in the page uh, in your style sheet. That would be uh, incredibly bad. You don't want to want to write CSS that way. Uh, you would have to have a different style sheet for each each page in the website. So jQuery encourages you to write your your JavaScript in a way that is more like your CSS. 
So one question that kind of comes up uh, that comes up frequently, and I want to uh, address here, is sort of the question of of caching. So one one problem that exists is that you know you're going to be doing these selectors very frequently in the page. You know you're going to be uh, it, like you're going back to that case I just mentioned. Uh, now this is say, find all the days of the class of month. Okay? And maybe we're attaching some click handlers to it, maybe we're attaching a hover event to it, you know, we'll look for the mouse forward, all sorts of stuff. Now the problem is, is that in jQuery, we would love to be able to cache this result. You know, we would love to be able to store this for later so that every time you call this, we just keep returning the same result again and again. The problem is, is that it's actually incredibly hard to do this. We looked at this a while back, looking at ways of caching these results. And essentially, any way that we found the cache uh, would just result in the page being really, really slow. There's something interesting you can look into if you have time to call it uh, uh, DOM mutation events. And these are really interesting. Um, they're a way to track and see what happens on the page. The problem is, is that any time you attach these uh, in Firefox and Opera and Safari, uh, any time you attach any of these events, your page instantly gets like two times slower, like across the board, for anything you do. Um, so we stopped using that because it wasn't very good. So, so the issue here is that, okay, let's say we want to look for all the divs of class of Right? And we want to cache this, so that we can keep returning this result again and again later on. The issue is that now, anytime anyone changes the class anywhere on their page, we need to be aware of that, so that we can go and update our set of elements. Or, anytime anyone inserts a div in the page, we need to be aware of that, so we can go and update our set of elements. Or, anytime it goes into the page and removes an element. All these are cases which could change this result. And, and the problem is that for that reason, we would have to keep updating our cache again and again and again. And it would end up being very, very slow. And there would, we would very rarely actually be able to keep ourselves cached. And in fact, the only case in which we continue to keep ourselves cached is if you find it, if you're only buying events. Because since events, events don't attach directly to an element. So just as a general rule of advice, something I recommend to you is that it's totally okay to destroy this relator. So take a bar of buttons and destroy the results from that selector. Did that button. Okay? And then, and, then, and then later on, we can just query again and again. So you can decide, you know, buttons, you can change, you know, an attribute on them, you can, you know, add a class name. You know, attach some events, whatever you need to do. This, and you're just referencing it by the variable in which you have to store it. Now, this is the best way to operate. And it allows you to uh, uh, avoid re-querying the page again and again. Now, this is because in this case, you're using knowledge that jQuery doesn't have, nor can it have. Because since you know when your page updates, you know when to update the button's variable. And so for, and for that reason, it allows your page to be the absolute fast as it can. Since again, you don't have to keep you know, checking again and again and again to see you know, what this set of did top buttons is. So uh, this, is, this is the easiest thing that you can do in your code right now to make your application faster, absolutely. Um, three minutes. Three minutes, okay. So I guess I'll go for questions then uh, uh, before I, I run out of time. Yes. So, so, so the question was, could jQuery cache that? Uh, so, I guess the thing is, is that theoretically, we could add in a flag that's like cache absolutely everything. But the chance that you're going to have a page that's completely static, it, I'd say, is pretty low. Uh, I mean, the, the very fact that you're using jQuery for, in the first place kind of necessitates that you're going to be changing things. Uh, so yeah, I, I would, you could add that, but I would, I, I'd be very skeptical that would be the case. Yes? Do you have any quick tips you can give um, with relation to using the .live method and how it affects performance? Okay, so.
so some quick quick tips related to the live method? Yeah, I mean the do's and don'ts or anything like that. Okay, so so jQuery has uh, a couple methods that help with uh, event allocation. Uh, dot by dot delegate uh, specifically, and the way uh, event delegation works is um, so. For example, let's say we have a button down here. This allows you to attach a vet. So in the case of a live event, uh, um, you know, we say, you know, find all the buttons, and when they're uh, uh, live clicked, uh, do something. So what happens is, is that when you're doing a live event, it's actually attached to an event up to the HTML element on the bottom, on, on the dot. So the event is going here. And what happens is, is that when the click happens, it bubbles up the document, and eventually up to the HTML element, and we capture and interpret it. So general rules for performance, uh, uh, you want to, it, it's essentially the same thing I was talking about, you want to have selectors that fail very quickly. Yeah, yeah, because we're, yeah, we're working right to left in these cases. So things with an ID in it are going to be fantastic. You know, again, so the, uh, having having just something that's you know, ID something live, you know, that's great. Although the issue is then if you're doing a live event with something with an ID, there's probably only be one of them on the page anyway, so you should probably just be binding to it anyway. So um, so again, if you're going to just try and limit as much as possible. So the simpler the selectors, or maybe just a class name, would be good. Uh, and again, if you're choosing a lot of the stuff, then you know, you're going to have problems. Um, so yeah, so I think all the time people are coming in. Uh, but yeah, if you have any questions, I'll be around, and I'll be happy to answer any questions about jQuery or anything. Yeah, thank you.